Hello, welcome to our latest edition of Portfolio Briefings. My name is Mona Dola, I'm the Deputy Editor at Portfolio Institutional. And uh, we'll be looking today at the impact of COVID-19 on pension schemes. And with us today, we've got Richard Boccio, who is um, the Chair of the PLSA and the Managing Director at PTL. So he will be very well placed to give us some insights in how this all has affected pension schemes. Welcome today, Richard. Thanks, Mona. Hello. I'll try and give you some insight. Thank you. Um, so first of all, let's start, start off with the unusual circumstances. Um, how are you and how, how is your team? <laughs> well, you give thanks for asking. Um, oh, I mean, I'm absolutely fine. I, you know, this, this has been business as usual pretty much for me. I haven't been having to do the commuting that I used to have to do. I haven't been having to rush around the country quite as much. But the amount of work that's been going on has just stayed exactly the same. If anything, it's actually slightly increased. So I'm well. Team's doing really well as well. Um, so they moved home and started operating from home really efficiently. I'm so proud okay. of them for being able to do that. We're having 11 a.m. coffee calls every morning just to stay in touch with each other and chat about rubbish. Uh, and they all sound like they're in good spirits. Okay, well, that's great news. And you already hinted a bit uh, that it's actually busier now than it has been before. Um, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I think it's a, uh, it's a number of things that are causing that busyness. For a start, it's our point in the year. We happen to have our year end at the 30th of April. So it's year end and year beginning stuff. But in terms of client work, um, yeah, it's been busy. Uh, and we've got a proportion of clients who are struggling with COVID-19, uh, where their covenant has been impaired. Uh, and they want to take action as a result of that. So we're having to uh, factor that work into our program. Very happy to do that. We're here to help our clients. Mm -hmm. uh, but even those clients, and it is a minority of our clients who are, who are suffering through this, or directly suffering, significantly suffering through this, the vast majority of our clients are just having to operate in, a, in an unusual way. So we've been having to spend more time with all of them to make mm -hmm. sure the operation of the pension scheme is unaffected, that we can continue to pay uh, pensions as they fall due, that we can continue to make investments as we should do, that we should be able to continue to exercise good governance as we have done. Okay, when you say taking action, I mean, there's been some talk of, of schemes suspending, for example, contribution levels to help the, the sponsor companies deal with, with the effects of the crisis. Is that something you've come across? Yes, yeah, so we're seeing some of this happening. As I say, it's, it's, it's quite a small proportion of our portfolio. Um, we do regular risk assessments of our clients uh, and, and our assessment at the moment is that about 9% of our clients are at risk. Um, that compares to pre-COVID of 3%, so it's quadrupled, but it's still a relatively small number, 9%. Uh, and those clients, that's our assessment of their risk. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that that risk will manifest with them. But certainly, yes, we've started to have dialogue with some clients who are looking to reduce their contributions or suspend their contributions for a period of time. Okay, just to run us through very briefly, how would you define risk, being at risk? So in that context, actually, the risk assessment is around our revenue, the risk to BTL, mm -hmm. but it's a proxy for the number of clients who are finding it distressing. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that gives an indicator in any case. So mm. Obviously, it's still very early days. But let's talk a bit about the impact of um, investment uh, on the investment strategy as well. Um, do you think there has been a significant hit on investment returns because of the crisis? Well, there has. I mean, you know, we've seen equity values dive, nose dive, uh, and then uh, come back up again. We've seen long dated gilt yields uh, increasing. Um, the trick is really to try to work out how much of that is because of hard economic reality and how much of it is just noise caused by the emotional reaction to the COVID crisis. Um, certainly the nose dive at the beginning, I suspect a lot of that was just the emotional reaction to the yeah. COVID You know, as trustees, what we're doing is we're investing for a very, very long period of time. Um, and, and when you invest for a very long period of time, the challenge is always to try to filter out the noise. You don't want to make decisions based on temporary circumstances you don't want to sell at the bottom and then buy at the top um, now i'm not suggesting necessarily that this is noise this is likely to signal an economic uh, recession or even depression um, greater than the 2008 event um, but it is you know we've got to make rational decisions over the long term and even 2008 over the long run 
doesn't make an awful lot of difference to a pension fund investor as long as you've got the liquidity when you need it. And that could be the case here as well. I suppose it depends a bit on how mature the schemes are as well when they're looking at... Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, that's one of the factors, as I say, as long as it's got the liquidity that you need. Mm. If you were aiming a buyout within five years, then you need liquidity of five years. Mm. And if this is going to impact on your liquidity in five years' time and the asset value is five years' time, it's critical to you. It's critical to you. Does that apply to some of the schemes you're working with or do they have, tend to have a longer horizon? Uh, I think it's very varied. Um, we've got some with a relatively short horizon of five to ten years. Um, we've got some with a very long horizon, uh, well mm. beyond sort of 40 or 50 years. Um, mm. the, the, the five to ten year time horizon in clients, well, uh, I mean, in generally speaking, they're all in pretty good shape. Uh, they've de-risked, they've taken uh, risk out to their investments. So hopefully they should have been well placed. They've hedged their risks. Um, so they would have been well placed for this sort of shock to the system. Then the challenge is to, uh, in the short term, just look and see whether the investments have actually done what you're expecting them to do and whether you're in the position that you're expecting to be in. Mm -hmm. um, do you see any changes in investment strategy already among schemes? Not already, but now is not the time to be making long-term investment decisions because there's all of this noise in the background. It's hard to know what has changed the, to the underlying economic model. So I think at the moment, what you've got to do is, is to a certain extent just um, grin and bear it. Uh, and, and then once all of the emotive noise is drained out of the market, then try to make decisions based on hard economic data. So now is not really the time. If you are making investment changes now, it's probably the wrong time. The, the one exception I'd make to that is, um, you know, as I say, a lot of schemes will have hedged out their risk, and a lot of that, uh, um, that uh, hedging will have been leveraged. So we've seen deleveraging and then releveraging events uh, over the course of the last six weeks or so, which we've had to react to. Okay, interesting. I suppose the challenge will be that knowing that the crisis is going to go on for quite a bit, to still have some hedges in place for if, if things start kicking off again? or Yeah, I mean, the crisis, well, I have no idea, but I assume that the crisis will run a course uh, over potentially 12 to two years, 12 months to two years, who knows? Um, but it's, it's seen beyond that. You know, what we're concerned with is economic data uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and trying to assess what's, what damage it's done to the underlying economics. So... You know, though it sounds cruel and hard, we're less concerned about job losses. What we're more concerned about is the damage to a, an employer's covenant, to its ability to pay a dividend stream uh, in the context of investments. So have we got a business, are we investing in a business that's now going to wither and die? Or are we investing in businesses that actually could flourish? And there are businesses that will flourish. So mm -hmm. it's, as I say, it's, it's trying to put the emotive uh, analysis to one side and think about the hard underlying economic analysis and at the moment it's really too early to call in part that's because um, we don't know what the time horizon is so we don't know what businesses are going to thrive and what businesses are going to suffer through this mm -hmm. it's interesting it kind of suggests seems to suggest as well that more in detailed analysis of individual company results and um valuations might become more important as opposed to like before the crisis we've seen the growth of passive investments so let's see let's see how that will be affected by yeah it. i mean i think that's a fair analysis the, the you know, passive investments you know, my, my personal view is that trustees should be agnostic on whether you invest passively or actively mm -hmm. um, and we should take guidance on that point from the underlying sponsor because ultimately they they underwrite the costs of the scheme um, up to a point, you know, if a covenant is weak, then you have to make a decision in your own right. Um, what swings in favour of passive, though, in, in being agnostic, you have a slight tilt towards passive because it's lower cost. So one thing we can control is cost. What we can't control is future returns uh, beyond the point. So we should be biased in favour of passive. And, and passive has won big over the course of the last few years because there's been a bull market that the stock markets continued to go up and passive investments have continued to go up through that. It will be interesting to see whether the shape of that debate changes again uh, now that we've had some really big shocks to the system. Some of those diversified growth funds that were being vilified um, yeah. in the first quarter of this year and back end of last year because they weren't producing the growth rates that were, uh, that were wanted will now actually have done a lot better 
uh, compared to the rest of the market because they've been able to take a defensive position. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, as you hinted already earlier a little bit, uh, um, markets have become quite a lot more volatile as well, which is, I suppose, a challenge steering through that. What do you think are the reasons for that? Well, as I say, a lot of it's emotionally driven. Um, you know, the, the, the first shocks to the system as we went into lockdown were caused by fear. Um, nobody knew what was going to happen. Markets don't like uncertainty. And when the prime minister of the land stands up and says, right, what we're going to do is send everybody home. We don't know how long you're going to be at home for. Then markets are just scared. And, and, and so there's a flight of capital. Uh, and that caused that initial uh, volatility. Now the picture is becoming clearer, starting to become a little bit clearer. We're starting to be able to see winners and losers. That's uh, transferring into uh, or translating into economic data. And so we're getting less volatility, more market certainty. Mm. Okay, interesting. I mean, there's, I guess there's still some disputed cases, like, for example, airlines, how they're going to be affected with some people actually like Warren Buffett being really bearish and others kind of trying to make contrarian bets that it will play out in the long term. And I guess Yeah, well, you know, it is a, it's a question of picking the winners and losers, isn't it? As it always is, mm. it's just that at the moment there's quite a lot of, there's a lot of cards face down on the table. We don't know what those cards are. Um, so it is quite tricky to be. But, you, you know, as I say, there are winners and losers. Airlines could well be losers. Mm. And interesting that they're now projecting, I think BA were projecting, that the volume of air traffic won't pick up for another 10 years again, not to the level it was before. Uh, so airlines were suffering. We're mm. also seeing smaller shops, smaller retail chains um, suffering because, of course, they had to close their doors. Mm. But there have also been winners. You know, the food, uh, the food chains have been signing up new customers left, right and centre. Uh, the delivery companies are growing like topsy. So there are, there are winners and losers. It's just a question of trying to pick those winners and losers. Yeah. If you think across all asset classes, a bit of a broader picture, where, where do you see the key investment risks for pension schemes? I don't think that analysis has actually changed very much. Uh, um, just because of the volatility in the market, it's not significantly changed. Um, it, it may well have made it a little bit more acute, but it didn't mm. significantly change. So the investment risk is always in your equity portfolio um, because values can fall on well, as well as rise. And what will drive a fall in an equity value is not just what how the company behaves, which is within their control, but also how the market behaves, how their sector behaves, and the perceptions of how they behave. Um, so the risk is always there. I mean, actually, the biggest risk for any DB scheme uh, is that you've got your asset allocation wrong. Um, and we'll, we'll have seen some schemes going through that particular pain right now where they've retained quite a lot of risk on, even though relatively speaking, they might be a risk off, they might have a risk off liability profile, in which case what they've seen is their funding position weaken significantly. So the asset allocation mm -hmm. is the biggest risk for pension scheme. If you're looking within the investments themselves, the equities remain the highest risk. Okay, interesting. Yes, uh, bonds have obviously also been doing a little bit better in the whole thing, thanks to central bank action. So your suggestion is schemes should be looking at, at reducing the equity exposure further, potentially to, to minimise some of those risks. No, no, not at all. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, I'm saying that they represent a greater risk, but I'm not saying we should necessarily reduce our allocation. Mm -hmm. I'm saying we shouldn't really do very much at all at the moment, because at the moment it's very yeah. difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the equity prices um, are still being heavily impacted by emotive responses to the crisis, as opposed to economic crisis, as opposed to economic evidence. So at the moment, you're sitting where you are. You just have to accept the fact that there, there is that equity risk. There has always been that equity risk. That analysis hasn't changed. Yeah, and I suppose it's really hard to make a bold statement without taking into account the individual schemes situation and how long they've got what their membership looks like yeah absolutely yeah that makes sense um we just um so we've covered quite a few things already but as i mentioned in the introduction you of course you've got two hats on yours are speaking as chair as the pl of the plsa um what do you think the plsa can do to help pension schemes steer through the crisis i think the plsa is already doing a cracking job uh, so you asked earlier on how my team was doing. The PLSA teams have equally done a cracking job in relocating to home and continuing to operate. Okay. I, I mean, what we're trying to do is um, at the PLSA is um, have more contact with our members. So we've run a number of online seminars over the course of the last weeks. 
Uh, the most recent one was about the COVID crisis itself and the impact on pension schemes. So it's keeping our members informed and giving them the benefit of uh, the collective wisdom of the membership so that all of the membership can be in a nice strong position to react and deal with this. Um, uh, and and you know, we've produced a number of fact sheets around responses to the likes of COVID-19. So again, that uh, uh, all of our all of our members are kept well informed on how they can react. So I think it's just, again it's much the same as the past. We've got to continue to support our members to provide them with the technical input that they want, or provide them with a conduit for making policy arguments. Or we've perhaps got to do it a little bit more remotely, uh, although perhaps more instantly. For them. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And uh, now comes a really challenging question. But what do you think the world will look like in a year's time? Uh, that is a really challenging question. We'll have world peace. Everybody will love everybody. Barack Obama will be back in the White House. Uh, and uh, now who knows? Again, who knows? I, I mean, I'd, I'd like to think that if we're not through this particular crisis, we'll be substantially through this crisis. Um, the economics will have settled down so that we can make informed decisions. Um, the I. The jury's out on whether the world's going to go back to the way that it was before. Uh, the default setting is that we all go back to the way that we were working. So we start commuting again, we start rushing around like bilio. But I think we've learned a few things through this. The ease with which we can remotely meet, um, mm. the ease with which we can remotely operate. Uh, and so I, I think the pendulum will swing back to that old model, but it's a question of how far back it'll, it'll swing. I mean, you know, we've got it relatively easy. We're, we're fortunate. PTL's had a very strong year. We've just finished our year end. We've had a, an absolute cracking year uh, for all sorts of reasons, completely consistent with our last the last five years of PTL. Um, but I'm very conscious of the fact that we've got it relatively easy. We've got a robust business. Mm -hmm. There are an awful lot of people out there who, who, who work in businesses that have been fundamentally affected by this, either because their business model hasn't been able to flourish, flourish during lockdown, or just because they work for businesses that are weaker. Um, and, and they're gonna be feeling the pain and suffering. So I would hope in a year's time, we have also a more altruistic world where we're all trying to help each other out through what's gonna be a really challenging time. Mm -hmm. Interesting, it is an argument that this is the test case in a way for the climate emergency that we are also facing in a way that this- Yeah, I, I think that's, that's right. And, you know, again, I, I, I talk about that pendulum swinging back to the way that we used to behave. The evidence is, or the early evidence is, that our environment has, has benefited hugely from us all staying at home. You know, the volume of car traffic throwing out um, uh, pollutants, air traffic throwing out pollutants, uh, just the fact that we don't move around as much has benefited the environment. You can smell the air is cleaner. You can see the sky is cleaner. Um, wouldn't it be great if one of the learnings from this is, hey, you know what? We don't need to rush around so much. We don't need to produce the pollution we've produced. So therefore we can improve the environment by working in a different way. I think it could be, if we put aside all the pain that everybody's feeling and saying, you know, we shouldn't minimize that. But if we put that to one side, this could be a turning point that would lead us and leave us in a much better place. Interesting. Well, that's some hopeful thoughts. <laughs> well, I think we've got to be hopeful. We have to be optimistic. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that, Richard. No problem. Good to speak to you. Good to speak to you.